Hello, dear friends. Today, in the Alatra TV studio, we have the esteemed Igor Mihailovich Danilov. Hello. Jana. Hello. In the previous programs, we touched on the issues that are tragic for modern society. We talked about ritual sacrifices of children, which were committed by the secret order, the Ninth Circle of Satan, as well as its representatives, who are the top of the world elite. We also raised issues about the hidden influence on masses of people, about the materiality of thoughts, about the influence of the third parties on the destinies of people. And it is interesting that according to the results of all these programs, people sent us a lot of emails where they expressed their sincere gratitude to you, Igor Mihailovich, because thanks to this knowledge, they already begin to analyze and understand what is really happening around them, what is happening in society, what world we actually live in, and what should be done, and how to act in order to change the situation for the better. And in these emails, people also suggest that we should consider another topic, the topic of magic and its influence on human life. Why this topic precisely? Because now, after the program Consciousness and Personality, with great responsibility they deal with the issues which were raised there regarding magic, regarding its influence on people's lives. And they see that this magic is inherent in, say, modern society in multiple manifestations, and, of course, when they observe what is happening in the world, they also begin to notice many facts, which they have no explanation about, and scientists have no explanation about these phenomena, about what is actually happening. That is why the suggestion is to reveal the topic of magic today as to raise the issues about the nature of these magical phenomena. Well, the topic of magic cannot be revealed in one program. But to talk briefly on this subject, if our friends are interested in it, we can. Thank you. Well, if we enter the query in Google, in particular the protection from magic, the number of search results that pop up is enormous. People are wondering how they can protect themselves from magic, from hacks, from witchcraft, and, of course, respectively, on the same number of requests, there is the same number of offers with the services from people from different dubious resources on how they can help people with this. And not only people themselves study the issues of magic, but science is also engaged in this, in particular both ethnographers and historians were engaged in this. And here is what interested us. In particular, ethnographer and historian Sergei Alexandrovich Tokarev said the following. It would seem that with such great importance of the issue, which is not only purely of academic, but also of practical interest, the problem of magic should have long been subjected to serious research. Its essence and origin should be quite clear for science. But in reality, it is not so, although much has been written about magic. And here is the question. Since society has such a huge demand on, say, this topic, why does science not have a clear answer to the topic of magic yet? Well, let's just put it simply, because this topic is not funded. And magic is related to the science of ethnography. And who should really study magic as such? Well, the first should be physicists. Physicists, psychiatrists, neurophysiologists, neurobiologists — these are the ones who should really study magic. And what is ethnography? They come, they look. And what rituals take place in one village, what rituals take place in another village, and they compare them, without any base, without any knowledge, observing only what is visible, and draw some conclusions. Is this science? Sorry, ethnography is good science. It preserves the rituals, it preserves the past, it describes what's left of it, but it describes what is being observed. Whereas magic is what happens at the invisible level. After all, all the rituals in magic, whatever they may be, are all intended only to focus the attention of a person, no more, so that a person would come into so-called resonance with the one who performs the ritual. Or, to put it simply, a person who observes a magic ritual simply opens his gates wide, and then demons can not only enter, but also write in cards. Well, that's what all this is done for. 
and, so to speak, even all religious rites are borrowed from magic, since magic originated long before religions. This is true. Does it turn out that, in modern society, no one actually studies this topic of magic? No. In modern society, if we take even the last century, it has been studied as thoroughly as physics has been. Well, I'd say the number of institutions engaging in it wasn't smaller. Let's say, was the Soviet Union engaged in it very closely? In the beginning of their establishment, after the revolution, they were spending tremendous amounts of money on it, and lots of scientists were studying precisely that, which we now call magic. There were expeditions, those very ethnographers were involved. Well, and a lot of effort, time, and human resources were invested in studying magic practically up to the last day. Then again, everybody knows, such an organization as Ananerbi, right? When Hitler came to power, they took all this to the state level by that time. After all, plenty of institutions were working again on this issue. Well, and let's take that very America or the United States of America, didn't or don't they pay attention to it? And what country doesn't pay attention to magic? Mm -hmm. A lot of them do. And there are plenty of secret issues. The question is different. Why isn't it publicized? Why are the results of this research not publicly released, so to say, right? Society is unaware of those results which were achieved by these institutions. While the answer is very simple, you have just mentioned the Ninth Circle. Those who they work for, or who they try to find something against, again, they try, just like you said, to do a search on Google, how to protect yourself from black magic. And there are a lot of mages, as well as charlatans, of course, yes. who start offering various magic rituals, charms, protecting from magic. Well, it's kind of funny, right? That is, protecting oneself from magic by means of magic, fighting fire with fire. Well, there is exactly such a question about white and black magic, because white mages claim that black magic is always injurious, it's destructive, there are always demons and dark forces behind it, whereas white magic is completely different. This is what has God's power behind it. And thus, interpreting it in this way for their clients, they kind of say that for using this white magic in their life no harm will happen to them. And of course, the payment is made not the way it made in black magic. For example, payment is sacrifices, some ritual things, when afterwards a person pays during all his life for putting a hacks, for instance, or committing some actions. And these white mages, as you say, they help people absolutely free of charge on a voluntary basis, right? Of course not. And why? If they say that no harm will follow, absolutely free of charge. Or they do take money for that, or some jewelry, don't they? They do, of course, yes. As of today, I know only one organization which is honest and honorary indeed, whose volunteers don't take absolutely anything from anyone, but do a lot of kind of good things. There are lots of projects which hardly can be manageable by any institutions, whereas people do themselves. Among these things, plenty of attention is also paid to the sphere of the spiritual development. And among priests of all religions, let's say, who are in this organization, they try to convey the truth to their congregation, not twisting it, but on the contrary, correcting the mistakes that were brought from the mind into their religions. And there is a great number of people who don't belong, as it may seem, to any religion, but nevertheless, these people do a lot for the spiritual development of people. This organization is a latra. Great. Isn't it so? Yes, it is. Where people can help each other really gratuitously and with a pure heart, while all these communities, and all others as well, don't do anything free of charge. Now let's go back. So they take money. And isn't money an equivalent of payment? Of energy. So a person spent his time, spent his effort to earn some money, 
And he gives mages this power of his, which he spent on earning this money. Well, isn't it so? It is. And it's interesting, Igor Mihailovich, that many people think that if they gave some money of theirs, then they sort of solved this issue, paid it off. No. Do they buy it off? Of course not. Money is, for those who engage in this, let's say, this is their work. They also, they are people, they want to eat, they need to wear something, but they also just want to somehow exist in this world and simply exist comfortably, let's say. That's why they take money. And in fact, if we speak about the cost, the financial issue, real mages have very high tariffs, and not everyone can afford them. As for those charlatans, yes, those ones take 50 dollars or 20 hryvnas, especially the ones who build an entire network. When he, pardon me, has his own mass media at hand, he starts to spawn these mages and fool people. And nowadays there is also the internet. They may even take 10 cents, up to God knows what amounts, in order to simply collect them from people, and the more the better. But real mages have unbelievably high tariffs. They are unbelievably high indeed, and not everyone can afford them. But the result is also different. If they are merely charlatans and swindlers, they work on trust, on the placebo effect, as they say. If it is something related to health or something else. Well, in the field of medicine, a person believed, and this helped him, because a human being has a mechanism that we doctors call placebo, right? Until today, this hasn't been studied, but… In fact, it's a redistribution of attention to the problem. A person invests his attention in solving the problem, or, as they say, he believes in this medication. If doctor managed to convince the patient, then the medication helps. But there are also others. Let's say the opposite cases, when the doctor really gives a medication that cures this problem, but the doctor himself, to some extent, doesn't believe in it or something else, and he transmits this disbelief to the patient, and it doesn't help the patient. Well, that's the way people are. But as for, let's say, these swindlers and charlatans in magic, well, there isn't much harm from them, thank God. Of course, there are a lot of them, but except for taking away money and destroying people's hopes, they don't bring much harm. Whereas the real mages charge an unjustifiably high cost, of course, it isn't just a financial cost. The biggest cost is the one which a person pays to obtain some results for himself by means of magic in this three-dimensional world. And as always, the result is material. Regarding human love, to bewitch someone or something else, to get someone back, some success in work, some career or financial issue, it doesn't matter. That is, a person turns to sorcerers, mages, either white or black ones, well, it's people who came up with the idea that they perform a certain magic action on behalf of, let's say, representatives of these particular saints or prophets of this religion, depending on what religion dominates that region. Or, for instance, they use the scriptures, or even supports for these scriptures, which allegedly have some kind of power, and they are using that power, right? However, even for a mage's small service, the person pays a disproportionately high cost, and this cost is life. He exchanges his life for death in order to get a momentary result, which again will not bring him anything good. No matter what a person receives, he will receive dissatisfaction, let's say so. Human love cannot be bewitched, Attachment can be. Well, your second half will be like a zombie, no matter whether it is a man or a woman. But all this is also shaky after all. It's a shame. In general, it is paradoxical when people precisely want to attract love, they tend to or receive love, that which is the highest, the most light-filled power. Everyone wants to receive love. After all, people don't want to love, they want to be loved. And again, they treat, we say, mages, mages, right? Yet how do people treat gods? Well, let's just take a look. From time immemorial, how have they treated them, right? Yes. Well, not from time immemorial, but over the past 6,000 years, how it all developed, let's put it this way. We also have interesting information. Deformed, transformed and exploited. 
However, in the literal sense, it's exploitation of gods. Well, isn't that so? Yes, so huge is. The egoism and human consumption are so huge. Human greed. Greed. And pridefulness. Igor Mihailovich, you've touched upon this topic about gods and about the consumer attitude of people to all these stories. And we have found very interesting information on how consumeristically and selfishly people treated that which they considered divine. Wait, why treat it? Do people treat it any differently today? How do they treat God? Yes, nowadays we have dominant religions. Desire to receive. Yes, they believe in one God and the like. But what is their attitude to him? Like to a genie who owes them something, and they come and say, give me. Well, isn't that so? Yes, the only thing. And what do religions do in response? Well, if we look today also, at any religion, there are a lot of magic rituals in it. Yes, exactly. Why is that so? Here is a simple question. After all, religion denies magic. How did it happen that they actually deny magic, but at some point they themselves use these magical rituals? Well, in fact, we have already mentioned, and more than once, that any religious organization is primarily an organization. And in any organization, financial interest predominates. Demand. What does any organization need? It is the number of buyers, to put it simply. A stable number of them. A good, solid corporation that can grow. But it can only grow when there is demand for its goods. Can one trade God? No. It's impossible. Yet one has to live somehow. And thus it happens, instead of gathering as a community, even if you need to build temples, they've built temples in their free time. People serve God, both who teach the Word of God and those who accept it, right? Meaning, this is a normal community, this is a normal relationship between a human and God. God must occupy, or let's say, the spiritual path must occupy 24 hours a day. It cannot be somewhat discreet, like we went and attend a service or perform the prayer service while the rest of the time we serve Satan. That means you are on the Satan's side, in no way you will be on God's side. But, again, the person to whom God gives nothing, and this person on the side of consciousness, where demons whisper to him, since God, the one you believe in, is omnipotent, He must be giving you something, He must solve your issues, He must give you life which is better than other people have. Well, how are you different from others if you believe in God, right? But if He… you don't get anything from Him, what kind of God is that? Everything is equal there, yes. Well, of course, everything is equal. And this paradox has led to the fact that people began to transform the knowledge into religions and teachings. And this transformation happened with a mixture of magic in addition. Why? Because magic, well, as we already said in the previous programs, such an enculturation, right? has existed for a long time. Well, of course, enculturation also plays a very important role when people lived by certain rules, when magic was natural to them, when completely different formats dominated, and here people came and imposed some religion on them. But without these rituals which gave them something, they would not have perceived it, sort of, let them be for a while, and then we will exclude them. Then they saw that this brought profit. Well, how can a corporation give up profits? It will simply collapse. Well, then such a synthesis happened of magic with the knowledge that the profits brought you. It's surprising that people create this demand themselves. Who else? And they run from religion to magic. And it doesn't matter to them, you know, who will solve this issue. The main thing is that someone would solve some problem of theirs more effectively. The transfer of responsibility is going on. Yes. And how can it be otherwise? So, the main thing is to solve, and no matter how. By any means, of course. Either a priest will solve this issue, or a mage, a sorcerer will solve this issue. And people don't care whether it's a genie, devil, or a god. They call the devil god only because he solves problems, that is, in the depths of human consciousness, there is an attitude to God exactly as, as they say, a caring Father who loves you, who gives you everything, does everything instead of you. In other words, 
God is the one who gives you something, the one who protects you, who helps you and who solves all your problems. Well, people have a feeling that God owes them, God owes nothing to anyone. It is people who owe God. Again, He gave them a chance to gain life. What can be more than that? But human greed, frightfulness, selfishness will turn everything into consumerism. Even this gift, they say, why should I have a gift of life if I don't live now? Is this life? Look at how this or that one lives. That's what I want, or even better. If God loves me, then He will give me everything, if He is God. And if He is not God, He will not give me. This is thirst, human insatiability. And here is another question, Igor Mihailovich. Many people think that it's very hard to sort of betray God, that in order to sign a contract or make a deal with the devil, some special ritual is needed, some special spells. The sacrifices. The sacrifices, yes. To sign the contract with blood. Yes. I mean, how hard is it for people to go over to the other side, say, to the bad side? Do they need all these ritual procedures to sign a contract with, say, the devil? Well, let's start with what is devil, right? Or what is the evil force? Is it material or not? It is subtle material. So the contract they can offer you will be also from their world. Therefore, it cannot be material and you won't be able to sign it. Well, that is imposed in fairy tales. Well, it's again, it's all allegorical. In fact, a person betrays God very easily, and practically everyone is betraying God many times a day. Is it easy? Of course it is easy. As soon as a person has perceived himself as a part of consciousness which dictates to him, he has begun to serve those demons, having forgotten about his essence, about his nature, about his perception through feelings, as soon as a person has forgotten about God's love, well, he has already signed the contract. He renounced life and accepted mortal destiny. That was his choice. Yes, there is an understanding of what is happening, because people do not understand that in every little choice, when they really renounce the material in favor of their spiritual development, when they take a step towards God and not vice versa, turn their back on Him, by this action they prevent this work of those who are on the top, which, as you described today, yes, the work of those who really stand behind all these dark forces, yes, of those who control both magic and people and And here's a simple question. For example, a person embarks on a spiritual path. After listening to you, people, an average man will have an opinion. In order for me to come to God, I have to renounce the material. Shouldn't I be dressed? Should I not eat? Should I not live in a house? Is this right? Or should I walk, not drive a car? Do I need a dog sled to go on it around town? They think that there should be some hardship, right? Yes, yes. Surely. Well, this isn't so at all. And there is a small point here. But here consciousness can twist this as well, if I tell people about it. In an ambiguous way, yes. Consciousness always twists in its favor. I'll explain, but it's a choice of people how to understand this. The point is that when a person embarks on the spiritual path, embarks steadily, he doesn't depend on these material impositions, on this excessiveness, he becomes free of consumption, I will put it this way. Of desires. Yes, it's not important by and large. But this doesn't mean that if you can afford to drive a good car, you have to drive a bad push scooter. Why? A simple question. And besides, when a person becomes stronger than a demon, becomes freer spiritually, he becomes free from it. It's then when he makes the demon work for him. Well, surely there are surpluses, I would call them so, which you can spend on your own selfishness, but you will lose spirituality then. Or you can spend these surpluses for the benefit of people on a good deed, yes? Then you will not lose anything. And many people have come across this, that when they embarked on the spiritual path, you know, and not like a weather vane on the house, which turns where the wind blows. But when a person really stands 
he overcomes all satanic attacks, all his temptations, he loses dependence on the Satan, on his thoughts, eventually he holds him on short rations, and Satan begins to serve him, and then he serves him faithfully, allows him to earn everything in a material aspect. Well, this is really so. Well, what happened over time? Well, it's already back then, after Sumerian times. Well, although they started this sacrifice from the times of El, when the descendants of Atlanteans came and taught them how to please God. But where did the substitution occur? The substitution occurred when they accepted that if you wanted to live well, you have to obey the devil. That's it, then you will have power, then you will have everything. And here is a serious substitution. Instead of making demons in your head serve you, you have to become so strong spiritually that you can make them serve God. And then they will serve God, they will serve you. And if you do not feed them, they will die. When you are spiritually free, when you gain life, here, at this time, in this life, you become entirely free, you are not afraid of death, you feel that home is there, and here you are just a temporary guest and you have to be here. And as long as you have to be here, those demons serve you. They serve precisely the deeds you do. And as a rule, people do God-willing deeds here, and at the same time solve their natural needs. Well, it's fine, it's natural. Well, then everything is going well. Why is it so? Because the demon will not deceive you then. He will give you the right instructions. Well, not the instructions, I'm sorry. Well, that's not exactly a slip of the tongue. Usually, demons in consciousness give orders and instructions which the Personality unwittingly has to follow. Subordinate. And here they give suggestions. The difference is huge, why? Because a person is spiritually free from the instructions of the demon. Well, he just does not react already, because he is free. But it again allows a person to achieve a better life in this material world. Well, it is not a key point at all, and it is not important. Why? Because there is no this dependence. Well, it is already as a side effect, let's say, but seeing and knowing this, they've started to go directly. After all, one has to overcome a lot on the spiritual path. One should really learn to feel, learn to love God. Until you begin to love God, you will not receive His love in return. That is precisely where you invest a tithe and get a hundredfold in return, right? That is, for your penny, they say, you'll get a hundred in return. What is human love? What can He give to God? It is merely human love. Yes. But He receives in return God's love. And He gets filled only when He radiates this love from within. What can be higher? Of course. Then comes the birth of life, then comes freedom, inner freedom from this matter. Then death is… well, you don't care about it. It is transition, transformation from one state to freedom. Well, it's like letting a bird out of a cage, isn't it? Well, what else can we call that? No other name. And not just to let the bird out of the cage, but into boundless fields, where life is wonderful for it, where the sky is blue, Igor Mihailovich, it is so delightful and beautiful. Yes, but… Uniting with the nearest and dearest. However, a human being must stay here and, let's say, till the last breath of his body. And again, not just to be selfish, to make these demons serve him exclusively with the purpose of some profit, but he makes them, I'll say it again, serve God. It means whether they want it or not, but they work for society, they work to help other people become spiritually free from similar demons. That's where power is. But here it is necessary to make an effort, it takes a lot of, let's say, striving and time. Well, in fact, consciousness only tells people so. It's very easy, guys. But consciousness says, it is difficult to serve God. Well, with a demon it's easy to reach an agreement. 
You come to a mage and ask him and he solves a problem for you. Waiting till someone starts working for you, Whereas here, a person already possesses that. After all, he already controls his own. And no, there is a substitution, a spiritually free person, who really subdued these demons and they serve the spiritual world and people. Or, as consciousness narrates, this mage, he conquered the demons and they serve him. Could this happen in the realm of magic? No matter what they are actually called, white mages, black ones, or even great striped ones. No. Mages are precisely slaves of the system, slaves of the demons themselves. And out of human qualities, only desires, only pridefulness is left, which is imposed precisely by consciousness or by demons. They believe that they can deceive Satan. Therefore, while in fact, yes, they themselves are deceived. It's impossible to deceive him. After all, he's the creator of all lies. Well, how can one fool him? Let's say, is it possible to win the game of chess against someone who created it? He can play giveaway. Give it a try. But ultimately, give it a try. It's possible if he wants it, but no more than that. But why would he need this, right? And now, what is the cost for someone who turned to mages for some, no matter what action? And why does it happen this way? That is, a person has come, he craves. Well, give me an example. The recent example. By the way, we have a question that is asked the forum to mages, psychics, who promise to get it done. And he is the question. You wrote about yourself that your main speciality is destructive impact. Aren't you afraid of the backlashes and irrevocable strikes on your karma in connection with the fact that you break the natural courses of someone's life and destiny? And will there be any harm to a person who came to you with a request? Won't punishment rain down on him? Well, of course, they reply. And what do they mean by punishment? In reply, they'll say, of course not, everything is fine, nothing will happen to you, because we take everything on ourselves. Yes, yes, It's yes. business, after all, right? Yes, that you won't have to bear responsibility. But the thing is that the mage is already inevitably dead. If a person embarks on the path of serving Satan, then how can he come into the Lord's world? A simple question. He is a slave of the system inevitable subpersonality. But that person who contacts mages for fortune-telling or something else, well, he wants to know what will be an example like this, yes. what people want to know, and we will expand on it. They actually want to know the future. The future. The future, right. Okay, so what is precognition? The mage must know the object of observation which the person wants to know about, because the future is enormous. And even, let's say, the mage won't be able to tell it. Particularly, a person wants to know, for example, what awaits him in the future. And there are key moments, which, well, let's say, like road signs, stand along his life, of the person. or in the path of this person, right? And a mage who possesses the ability of precognition, seeing this person, knowing his image, knowing his name, can walk the path of his life. What will this person pay with? A simple question. He will know that in store for him, for example, to have children, to build a house, well, classic. And he will also plant some trees. Well, trivial things. So he found out, even in some circumstances or something else, or he was forewarned about something bad. The mage might say, be careful at that time, don't drive your car, right? or go on food, on Thursday, for example, and nothing bad will happen to you. The person does this, lives, everything is fine, nothing happens. And now a question, but what did he pay with? And does he live indeed? And at whose expense will this all come true? Yes. After all, when contacting a mage, a person makes a deal. What does he exchange his life, his future for, for knowing what it will be like for him? A paradox, but it's true. And now a simple attention, please. And how exactly does he exchange? What happens at that time? Because nothing cannot come out of nothing. And the payment must be tangible. The power of attention and time. Time is an important factor which a person pays with. But much more important thing is attention. That attention which a person should direct to God's love, 
for uniting with the spiritual world, he redirects it to expectation or getting some results, afterwards to fears of retribution and all the rest, so he doesn't have and cannot have life, plus demons, who definitely the third forces connect very often. If you made a deal, if you, so to say, paid a demon once, he'll never leave you alone. Binding. He'll always eat you. Thus every mage gets a network created. Well, a network of debtors, let's put it that way. And it doesn't matter what amount of money you gave him. Although, I'll repeat, real mages have a very high price, but they give a result in a material world. Well, I mean a financial price. But that price which people don't know about is even higher. Meaning, it turns out that they pay a mage with their power and their vital energy, and among other things, they implement these programs themselves. Absolutely. They pay with their life. Not just with vital energy, but they pay with life. With life for an illusion. Sure. And they get an illusion. Because whatever he wishes for, home, loving family, something else, yes, he will have it, but it will be temporary, and it will disappear, pardon me, like a water. And here it remains. Just get a handful of water and do this, and you'll see it gone. The same goes for your life, just like water. It will slip from your hands. The same goes for your life. And what will remain? But a human doesn't understand what time fleeting is. And this is the worst thing. They want something right this moment, now. And there is another big problem that a human has on the whole, because a person who lives under the control of demons, under the dictation of his consciousness, that imposes desires, aspirations, fashion and all the rest. Because if we start looking into it, I'm telling you, magic is actually terrifying. Why? A simple example. What is fashion? It is imposition. Right, it's certain images imposed. Imposed images that eat a person. Well, a simple example, you saw someone wearing pretty sneakers. You want them too, you saw them and paid attention to them, to the fact that they are nice, they are comfortable, pretty and bright. Later, you see on TV or your tablet, it doesn't matter, on the internet, where there is persuasive advertising of them being a new model, that it's super fashionable, it's so beautiful. Then some celebrity again confirms this. She says and boasts that she bought such fashionable limited sneakers. And you, as an ordinary person, as an average person, will want to become like that star, to have such sneakers. And I want them for myself too, excuse me, but do you walk barefooted? Well, first of all, the price is ridiculously high, because it's a brand, because a celebrity walked in them, because she was paid for it, meaning common sense, right? Common sense disappears. And who kills common sense? A demon in the head. And it's he who forces to wish and strive. Well, isn't it magic? It is magic. Well, what is spiritual freedom? It's freedom from these mindsets. If your shoes wore out, you see that you need new ones. You go and get what's comfortable for you, what's decent and that's it. But you're not bound, you pay nothing for them except money. That is all. And precisely these demons help you to earn money. Right. And it's also interesting who determines this fashion. And who determines it? We once talked about the Ninth Circle, when you see how advertising is made, by whom it is made, and who embeds those very images. And what is it done for? And we, you see, all this gets overlapped, and everything gets mixed up, so it won't be so easy to reveal the topic of magic in one day. But we'll try to talk and explain something to you, friends. Although, again, everyone has their own opinion, their own life experience. Many people might say, what are they talking about while sitting there, right? After all, we had a situation, we went to a fortune teller, she told us, we did so, and everything is fine and beautiful now. It worked. Well, well, it happens, there are a lot of such cases. At what cost? For now, yes, my friends. But we'll talk later, when we meet not here. Yes, here is a similar story. A participant of the movement sent it. While living in Germany, she met a woman who was standing at the bus stop with a child and was just sobbing. It turned out that she had been deceived by her friend and she was left without a roof over her head. And she agreed to help her. And the next day, during a phone call, she heard such an answer from this woman that she already recovered from all that had happened to her and was already going to correct her karma. 
meaning a suggestion to walk in herself, the talk that she still has hope, that everything is in the hands of a person herself, that she just needs to make the right choice, didn't affect the person in any way. But the fact that someone can help here and now, that which you are talking about… To shift responsibility onto someone. Yes, onto someone. But excuse me, and who in a person, who is the one that makes people shift their responsibility onto someone? After all, it happens everywhere. Yes, onto someone. Starting from the formation of our society, the consumer format, we've already talked about this more than once, from simple, trivial ones like, in this case, appealing to mages or correctors of karma and the like, shifting responsibility onto someone. Yes. It does not matter whether it is a mage, a clergyman, whether it's a politician or someone else. Why does this happen? And here is also such an interesting point that… And why do they want yes. to solve other people's issues? Yes. That's right. But why and who forces a person not to perceive something by himself, not to strive for freedom? but to shift responsibility onto someone. Well, also, some kind of prompter inside tells where to direct it. Yes, there is also such a phenomenon when a person doesn't understand that the problems he has today, this situation is given to him to become stronger, but instead he regards this situation as someone else's guilt. That is for sure. Well, definitely, of course. If there is someone to blame, hence there is also someone who can help, meaning exactly what these white mages actually play on. That Despite all the complexity of the issue, there are those who can easily solve it, right? Yes, right. Therefore, if I can't solve it in a simple, human way, it means that I'm turning to some forces that will come and solve this issue, right? Yes. Well, they will come and solve it. But what is the point of this issue? I wonder if people are aware of where these forces come from, what many call a depositive white magic. After all, people don't understand where these forces come from. How can you say that you do good if you don't even know the source of this? Of this too. Well, he's doing it with a pure heart. Look, everything is simple. A person comes, for example, to that very mage and says, listen, I have a problem. In business, I need to solve it. He says, okay, we'll light a candle or do something else or perform some kind of ritual and your business will be fine. The person says, okay, and everything gets better in his business after a while. And that one who is engaged in white magic says, well, you see, I didn't destroy his business. I helped him build it. Is it a good deed or a bad one? Yet, how prideful this mage, sort of, I know better than this businessman. Okay, a child got sick. For example, a parent or parents with a child come to the hospital. Doctors make a serious diagnosis and say, it's hard to cure, we… well, as always, meaning it takes time. They cure the child, yet he falls from one disease into another, a chronic disease or a hereditary disease. Some people are in despair, it's a child, we must help somehow. They come to a white mage, he performs some kind of ritual and says, here, take these enchanted poppy seeds, sprinkle it on a child, or put the salt in his shoes and let him walk in them. And indeed, the child begins to recover. Did the mage do a bad or a good thing? A bad one. If we face the truth, what price parents pay for it? Not only he himself is already inevitably a dead man. Yes. The parents, who got involved into his web, they are already inevitably subpersonalities, but they also sold the child. Yes. What for? To be with him side by side for a couple of years, so that he delights them with his playing and health. After all, we care about our children's health, about their physical health, yet do we care about their lives? About their spiritual state. We do our best to ensure that the person, our child, and above all, he is a person, is well fed, so that he is healthy, so that he is smart, he finds a good job or build a good business, creates a good family, so that we have grandchildren, so that he gives us grandchildren, good ones, and so that they are fine as well. Yet do we care for how long he will exist? Will he enter the eternity? Because that's what's the most important. But why? Consciousness says, well, again, all this is sectarianism, religion, these are believers. That's what the attitude of consciousness is in even those who go to church and believe. He's a believer, while others are sectarians. 
well, they are totally stupid. Or the sectarians say, well, what we engage in here is talking about the truth, we talk about God, while in religions, clergymen are fooling people, they are downtrodden to the utmost. Well, in this way, they divide themselves into us and them. Confrontation. Certainly, this is banal manipulation of people by Satan. And ultimately, who is the one to survive? Satan. The system, yes. The system. It eats them, the others, and the third ones, and so on. Yet, can a person who loves God be against some religion or against something else? Even against magic, I ask a simple question. After all, this is people's choice. How can I forbid anyone? If a person wants to live, he lives. But if he does not want to live, he does not live. It's his choice. This is a right given by God Himself. Can anyone forbid a person? No. If a person likes to serve Satan, he serves him. A mistake. Well, again, what is the mistake in? In the fact that a person chose death instead of life. Well, that's his right. He is the one in charge. There is no knowledge. And this is already our problem. It is already not his problem. It is our problem of those who understand what knowledge is, what the path is. And now we must convey and offer it. And if he rejected it, this is his right. Well, isn't that so? Yes. But we cannot force anyone, not even our own child. Why? Because a child is a human being. And a human being has the right to choose, to choose life and to choose death, to serve God or to serve Satan. But he cannot but serve. Igor Mihailovich, how can parents protect their children? Many people think that they are… By their example, by their lives. And under no circumstances should they pressure or impose. A person should be free in his choice. This is the right given by God. And parents cannot claim that they have the right to deprive him of, say, the right of choice. They will not be able to deprive him of it. And how many examples we see in history when children of the clergy parents take the side of service to Satan. Even when parents did serve, they were truly believers, they lived by all canons, and they were worthy of the title of being clergy. And children became, I'm sorry, such a protest, yes, of the system. Sure, opposition of the system itself. A person should go to God from the inner, not through consciousness or through the mind. It must be an inner need. It is like a desire to breathe, it is like the sunrise in him. Well, not as, in any case, not as a sunset or the some storm or, or something else internal. When a person has a problem in his life, they tell him, you have it because you don't serve God. The person says, all right, I will serve God. What should I do? Where do I light candles? That's where it all stops. Again, to solve the problem. At most, he will go to light candles, again hoping that everything will get better for him. Well, isn't that magic again? To go and ask for material things. And no matter what anyone says, they say, you know, God, He is omnipotent. Everything is in His hands. He will give you everything. He has already given you. Not to waste. You shouldn't ask for more. You have to prove that you are worthy of it, worthy of what He gave you. To multiply this. And everything else. You will take yourselves, earn, create, do. They say, I cannot. How come you cannot? Then your desires come from demons. You want too much of what you don't need. Yes. It's, you know, the topic resonates with how we came across revelations of a Satanist, that he sort of believed in Satan and served. And he said, I serve. Um, well, when I served Satan, he said, I spent all my free time on this. But I looked at people who believed in God and that it was hard for them to spend as much time as I did. I didn't understand why it was so, but at some point he realized, well, sort of for himself, the fundamental thing about who God is and what, in fact, Satan is, well, who serves whom. And he also writes that I wasn't crying, I wasn't laughing, my feelings were zero. And then I realized that the power which I thought was mine actually belonged to demons that acted through me. I just opened the door to them, and they worked not only to deceive others, but also to deceive me. But at that time I was sure that I surpassed everyone around me. 
and I was acquainted with Christians at that time, but I didn't know anything about the Bible. In my opinion, Christians were just praying to some other idol, and I didn't know that there was only one God. And when he met people who really believed sincerely, truly, just like you describe it, the light was pouring out of them from the inside. Who felt God, not just believed and hoped. Who, yes, who exactly felt and lived by God. Who lived by the inner Alatra, by God's love. Yes. And he said that I couldn't even get close to these people. And how will he get close? I realized that it was power, it was real, that it was the light. Of course. Which was burning, that it didn't let anything evil get close to it. Absolutely right. I will give a simple example. Why can't a mage, as well as any demon, all the evil spirits, come close to a person who is spiritually free? Because a spiritually free person is nothing but a candle in the darkness. Here is a simple example. You can conduct an experiment. Turn off the light, light a candle. You will see that the room where it was dark became bright. Well, it is desirable to do this in the evening when the sun is not shining. And then take this candle and enter the next dark room. What will you see? That it becomes bright in there, in that darkness where you go with the light. Now try to bring the darkness to the light. Will you be able to do that? That's the answer, my friends. Banal physics. There is no place for demons where God's love is because God's love is light, while demons are darkness. Everything is very simple. So, Jana has also said about that person, in particular, that he thought he was about all people. And it's interesting that in Holy Scriptures as well, when you come across and read Patericons of Holy Fathers, you understand that it was precisely magic and these supernatural manifestations that they feared mostly. And they even prayed for them to disappear as soon as possible, actually, these magic manifestations, in order for them not to fall into pridefulness, arrogance. And why? Because again, when a person stands on the spiritual path, when Holy Fathers were walking this path, really, and we take not those who were canonized by pulling some strings and the like, because they'd brought a lot of believers and shown tricks, but we take real Holy Fathers. These gifts and possibilities were opening for them, because the devil is none other than a seducer. And when those demons or that, what we call consciousness, start to serve a person, then these abilities begin to manifest in him, abilities which don't exist as modern science claims. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, that very science studies them. Studies them closely. Very, let's say, seriously, yes. We have already talked about it. So, these abilities and these phenomena start manifesting themselves, and very actively. And here, all the phenomenon lies in the fact that if a person starts using them, how else can it be? After all, I do believe in God, I love Him, I feel Him. He's given me power, how can I not use this power for the good of people? And He becomes whom? The one who is called a white mage, a wizard, or something else. And eventually, He becomes a subpersonality and brings into the world of subpersonalities masses of people with Him. He is a seducer for other people in faith, because everybody knew Him as a true believer who firmly stood on his spiritual path and God opened these abilities to him and he started using them, so eventually megalomania and arrogance defeated everything. And it started with a simple thing. A person who really stands on the spiritual path, walks this path, who indeed has this inner Alatra burning inside, well, he just won't engage in magic. It isn't needed. No need for that. He's in a hurry to get home faster. Absolutely right. Through this stratum, through this filter. I'll put it simply. When the wind is favorable, when the sea is calm, when you go home at full speed, it's stupid to drop anchors, right? Which will hold you. Great. Yes, this is wrong. Yes. 
Igor Mihailovich, you just said about the reason for dropping the anchors. And I think the answer to the question already becomes a little clearer to our viewers. Well, I will read out the question as follows. What is the reason for such an unusual vitality and stability of magic, which influences the consciousness of people of all eras, from the Paleolithic to our days? The reasons, obviously, lie in some peculiarities of magic, in the very essence of this phenomenon. But what is this essence of this phenomenon? What is magic for a human being? Magic. Why is it so resilient at all times? What is its essence? Is it just some kind of a filter? Well, it's not a filter, no. In fact, magic is a desire for something a human does not need. It's a human's aspiration to get what he doesn't really need. It's just a dictatorship of the beast in human consciousness. That is what magic is. After all, who drives a person to these desires? His consciousness. After all, it tells him that you are miserable, flawed, or something else. But if you perform some ritual now or go to some mage, everything will be fine with you. You will have chances to become better, something else. Again, what is the reason for magic to be so resilient? It is human pridefulness. Because of his aspiration to have more and to seem like someone better than he really is. And by nature, he's actually very beautiful. And for some reason, the system drives people to seem like someone else. And this is the filter already. It's not the magic that's the filter, the system itself is the filter. After all, the devil is needed so that dead ones do not come to the alive ones. So that mature beings, angels, come to the spiritual world. That's the point. Those who choose life, and not those who choose immediacy. It's a pity that a lot of people get into these magical things, even without realizing it, by using something just in case, or because it's the way it is practiced in the traditions of a certain nation or area. No, well, traditions are traditions, they have nothing to do with magic. We're talking about magic now. Yes. And traditions, well, to grab the button if the cat has crossed your path, something else. It's not magic, these are such… By the way, another direction is talismans, charms, some things that a person surrounds himself with. This is a business. But believes that they will definitely protect him from hacks, jinx. And again, and where did all this come from? It came from real working signs, if we take it. Well, we don't need to go too far, Tripilia, yes, the culture. Because there were so many signs. Yes. Everything was covered with the Alatra sign, yes. on the stove, on the house, and in front of the house. Why? Because it was precisely for… While we consider times, seven or six thousand years ago, the time when the system was gaining power, when it began to assert itself in this world, after so many years of Lucifer being driven under the rock, he began to crawl out of there, and it was Precisely his manifestations in this world that spiritual people began to feel 
And knowing and understanding that, and feeling, first of all, that demons started to appear, they began to shut themselves out with working signs. A working sign is an active sign, and nothing drives a demon away as much as the light. That's why they covered everything with these light-bearing signs. Even the cities, yes, were in the form of a sign. Housing and everything. And how were the cities even built? Hello and round, right? Yes. Of course, so that all these evil spirits would bypass them and go away. Well, however, it wasn't magic. This is exactly the draw away the darkness. Well, a candle in the dark is not magic, it's physics. But what's interesting… And a working sign is also physics. But it's interesting that many people, let's assume, say that, oh, I don't believe in magic, for example. Does the fact that a person said that, I don't believe, actually guarantee him a protection from… From what? From hex, say, from jinx, from the influence of third forces on him. Just, I don't believe. That doesn't guarantee him anything. Because it's the demons in his head that say, I don't believe in magic. I do not believe in demons. I do not believe in God. I believe in the mind. But what is the difference? Whatever we call it, the essence will not change. Well, these are just epithets of the same thing. A person doesn't believe in magic, but at the same time, he always wants to… Or, for example, he always starts instilling in himself that I'm the best, I'm the strongest, right? It's fashionable right now, as they say. Instead of being like this, he starts instilling this in himself, as if by changing his attitude towards himself, By instilling this, he would change. Well, these are again stupidities and mindsets. Right. Adding to the topic of protection, there are ritual tattoos which in ancient times were used for protection against an evil spirit, meaning covered… Well, these are like signs, but then again, there are totem tattoos, there are signs which start to attract. After all, let's take even Alatra, right? This is the most active sign. For instance, we've just talked about Tripilia. It was used at that time most of all, and before that time too. Well, until the last time. In fact, this sign was in every religion. Many don't know that it used to be one of the dominating signs in all religions. Well, with time, the system has erased all this, of course. But if we tattoo it onto the body, will it be good or bad for a person? It's a simple question. They ask this question too. I see nothing good if a person gets a working sign tattooed on his body. Because it's like a flashlight, it… when it shines and something gets under its light from, let's say, the subtle world, and that which isn't good, let's say, very active beings, are unable to exist in this radiation, this is physics, these vibrations, well, they're extremely unpleasant. And there is such notion in physics as a backward wave. If a person gets tattooed it onto his body, it will work exactly the other way around. Is it good? A simple question. Well, right. Another example has come to mind here, of course, a more material one, about how they used tattoos in the Third Reich. And that very bad signs. And bad signs, right. Both spirals, counterclockwise spirals. And counterclockwise swastika. And counterclockwise swastikas were also found in the Third Reich. Well, because all this has an impact on… Well, yes, just like there were tribes that put both good and bad… And pardon me, beasts, schools and all the rest, meaning an aggressive sign, it… A person will perform see it constantly, and it will change masks on the person, he should comply. And consciousness will tell him, well, if you have a leopard grinning there, then you should be like that too. Well, all this is playing games. Basically, a dried chili pepper. A chicken claw at the windscreen. Yes, it's merely such a placebo effect. Placebo effect, yes, but it does work. And, well, excuse me, if a person hangs a chicken claw in the car with the purpose of warding of evil spirits, He'll attract flies, for sure. Do you know where one should put this chicken claw? In one's head, to prevent stupid thoughts from popping into. Such a tool. Igor Mihailovich, there is also such a topic about the magic of the word, as it is also called. Because researchers and ethnographers, while studying ancient religions, the religions that currently exist, and ancient peoples, said that the majority of rituals were built with the use of certain spells. Others say, no, there were silent rituals too, where actions were important, not the rituals. And now they have such a dispute. What is actually paramount and more important? Perhaps it is the word that influences 
or maybe it is the action that influences. Which one? None of them is important. Or maybe the place too, the one with intersections. Neither the place is important. Those spells like go to an intersection. Whereas an intersection does play a certain role, but a busy intersection. When many people move in one or another direction, let's say, especially if it's an intersection of busy roads, then it does play the role here. Why? The flow of people is, well, sort of like rivers. Rivers of energy where these demons live, it's just easier to make a deal with them, there. But if we look at the roads, there are places where accidents happen constantly. Yes. Why? Well, well, a geomagnetic zone, the location is such, a reverse flow is formed. But this is only on those roads where there is active traffic, a stream of people, a stream of energies, some kind of anomaly, some kind of dead end, where, let's say, predators can be present. But it's enough to place the Alatra sign, and the order is restored, let's say, on that very road. That is, in this case, the signs will work, right? Towards positivity, towards creation. They will work, yes, signs will work. We're as magic as it is, with just… What is more important, a ritual or a word? A word. Neither ritual nor word is important in magic. It is the investment of attention that is important. That's what is important, where the energy of life is invested. If it is invested in a certain action, the action gets fulfilled. But again, if a mage fulfills it himself, well, a real mage, right? After all, he basically performs that very meditative practice. I mean a real mage, but not some playing around. Whereas those who imitate them, or when it is done in public, then a certain ritual is performed. This ritual should attract attention, it should let's just say, cause a person to open up, that is, to attract him by an action, a sound or something else, well, similarly to some kind of service or whatever else. Divine services. I mean, in this case, yes. Ritual actions, yes. A ritual action takes place, doesn't matter whether in religion or magic, but a staged action takes place. And this staged action, just like a theatrical form, makes a person invest attention and open himself up, mm -hmm. open up in order for demons to be able to enter, nothing more than that. Mm -hmm. And then people who watch this get involved into this process. Mm -hmm. But we've been discussing before this, why are people who live by God's love not affected? Because they have the best protection, they have a shield. And this shield is called the Latra, meaning God's love. Great, which is constantly active, yes. Whatever we call it, yes. yes. Many sort of alatra, alatra. Well, it is translated as God's love, that is alatra. It's just like you've said that this is life which He has already now. Quite right. If He, a human being, already has life, if He has gained it, then nothing is important for Him anymore. He needs nothing else. The devil has nothing to seduce Him with. What can He offer? Death? Well, somehow, it's stupid to exchange life for death. Yes, but what is empty? Of course. It's interesting, Igor Mihailovich, that people also ask a question. Where do mages actually get such a huge power from? Many say that it's inherited. For example, someone is a mage in the third, fourth, fifth generation. Meaning, where do they take it from? Is it that when people open up? There is a power which can be inherited indeed. But as a rule, this power is formed along with the demon's development in a person if a person is engaged in magic, he embarks on this path, the path of a mortal, and begins to develop these abilities in himself, which means he grows a demon. And the more people he draws into his rituals, creating a web like a spider, we have already talked about this today, the more people come to him with requests, and the more sorcery acts he commits, everyone starts with simple things. Yes. And then they move to bigger ones, then much bigger ones, and then eventually, mages take away life at a distance. It's not a problem for them. When somebody comes to them and asks, as it said, to get rid of a competitor or someone else, that is, it's not much of a problem for them, well, then again, everything depends on the power of the demon which he has grown. And another thing Igor Mihailovich would also like to… about… I'll put it simply. I would compare a demon to a piglet. The better you feed it, the fatter and bigger it becomes. And wait, in that world is hierarchy. It plays its part. Yes. Besides, in addition to the topic of words, the power of the word, 
Such information was found that ancient people had prohibitions on some names, on their own ones and names of the dead, meaning it was believed that through a name it was possible to influence a person somehow, just like using a piece of his body, for example hair or nails. A name and an image. A name doesn't work by itself. But if there are both name and image, then yes. Here's a simple example. A person comes to a mage and says, I need to hex this man, here is his name. Well, that's how they, in general, to do something bad to him. If the one who orders this ritual action knows that man, he has his image, the mage has the name, or he might not even have the name, but the one who orders, he has the name, and the one who orders has the image. So it's enough for the mage to attract this person's attention by his action. This person opens up, and the mage completes through him the order, right? Meaning, what the one who came has requested will happen to that man. But if he contacts the mage with his request through the third party, and that one has never seen that man, then however powerful the mage is, he will be unable to do anything. Because in order for magic to work, the image and the name are needed, just like with the dead ones, right? Mm -hmm. Meaning, when a person becomes subpersonality, people share their life with the dead man till they remember his image and his name. And the more emotionally they think of him, the more frequently he arises in their head as an image with a name, the more life they give to an already dead. Here's also a question, Igor Mihailovich. It turns out that the representatives of the Ninth Circle very often popularize, say, their dead ones, those who have passed away to the other world. And in the same way, they canonize people who are far from being holy. It appears that people endow subpersonality with a certain power. But it's still temporary. But does subpersonality help them? Why is it so beneficial for them to popularize these very people? Well, because those who are in the Ninth Circle are already dead. Today their elders have passed away, tomorrow they will. If they make such continuity, then the better they take care of their dead ones, the better their descendants will take care of them. It's just such a tradition. When they become subpersonalities, they prolong at least their relieved existence, and they know this for sure. And that's why they take… The partners of such tradition. Of course, they take care of that. But time erases everything, as you once said. Everything ends. And the memory of them too. Of course. Well, it will prolong for a hundred, two hundred, three hundred years. There will be some relief. Well, anyway, everyone will have to pay for everything. And those who become, excuse me, who enter the Ninth Circle, in this case, it's for a long time. Well, some people also think that, yes, it's playing around, that I can easily leave it, get off all these magic rituals… Of magic? …actions. Then why doesn't anyone leave? Well, it is extremely difficult to leave magic. If a person has messed with magic, he becomes a donor of not only that sorcerer or sorceress, it does not, or a witch, whatever she is called. Well, a conductor, let's put it simply. After all, this mage doesn't have any power. Demons have power. It's they who do all this instead of him. Well, he is a conductor. They feed them, yes. Absolutely right. He's just a three-dimensional picture. Or it's like something higher manifests itself in a human body, and that's it. Well, here, well, although if we take demons, they exist for a long time, longer than people, they possess greater power. And for people, they can also be higher beings compared to a human being. Well, we can put it this way. I also recall the question from people. They say that, for sure, to counteract, say, the system or all these mages and sorcerers, a person has to be someone, to have a certain power, to be a priest exorcist or to be a Geliar who has the knowledge. Is it possible to resist them in everyday life just by being a good person? How can any person resist the system and magic in everyday life? Not to betray God and to live by God's love, to love God, and everything will be fine. Mm -hmm. There is no better protection from demons, from black magic, than Alatra. In this case, I repeat, Alatra is God's love. Live by it, and then 
any demons won't be a threat to you. Because it is what gives life, and it gives life eternal. Igor Mihailovich, I would like to continue the following topic as well, to touch upon the topic of a gaze. After all, eyes can emanate both love, and there are other people's beliefs when the evil eye… Eyes actually reflect the inner component of a person himself. If a person is empty inside, his eyes are also empty. If a person burns with fire, if God's love shines in him, this light, then his eyes shine as well. This is normal. It's difficult now to ask a question regarding the evil eye and to touch upon this topic in magic, but nevertheless, I'll read it out. Do such people really exist who can, well, let's say, harm other people with the power of their gaze or… They can harm both people and animals and the like. These are people who possess, well, extraordinary power of their attention. While a power is a power, it's just when being used in the wrong way, it can harm even if there is no malicious intent. A person can be just wonderful in his essence, whereas his gaze might be destructive. So, it is possible. Well, such thing happens. And there is another thing, that people feel other people's eyes on them. And they say that, well, people used to say, cheeks are burning, for example, or ears are burning, that even research was carried out on how people feel other person's eyes on them. Both other person's gaze and when he is being thought of, especially with investing attention, a person can feel this. Well, the answers are in this book, in Alatra. This is work of the structure of the essence and so on. From time immemorial this has been known, since the beginning of time all this has been used. But if we are to speak the language in which human structure is described in the book Alatra, the back and the left essences, the back and the right, react very easily and again, precisely with the help of these essences, some magic techniques are used. But what's the difference? The structure is the structure. And with their help, people both feel and transmit something, well, just like SMS, via modern gadgets. When thinking of someone, a person starts feeling that he is being thought of. Yes. It exists, of course, this is trite physics. Right. In addition to this, they say that people feel exactly this area of the back of the head when someone is staring at them with a certain… Well, it takes place if there is a direct look at them. This means when a person is in front of the one who is looking at him from behind, and the person might feel this stare if the one is paying his attention. But this attention should be invested along with some desire, either, pardon me, with lust or with harm. Whereas if someone is just looking at the hairdo, the person won't feel this. Some powers must be involved here, energy must be spent. Then this is felt. I see. Right. We have another topic regarding the veneration of the Holy Death, Santa Muerte. And this religion is sort of gaining popularity now, and it attracts by the fact that the Holy Death does not require a person to abandon his previous way of life. That is, there are a lot of such representatives in it as prostitutes… Yes, drug addicts, yes. Yes, there are some drug addicts, murderers… That is, it turns out that people do not have to change their way of life. The way of life, yes, that without giving up anything, a person as if receives patronage and protection of this very holy death. This is a religion of subpersonality. Yes. It is aimed at a person while still being alive, sort of forms his after-death fate, let's say, an extremely negative one. However, respect and commemoration of the dead is very popular among them. So, from generation to generation, they remember images and names and the like. And so they communicate with them, often call them, meaning they feed up personalities. Why has this developed? A simple question. Because the person who, as you said, leads an antisocial lifestyle, understands that he's doing something wrong, but desires and aspirations, meaning he's manipulated by his internal imps. In other words, he digs his own grave. But this religion is preferable to him, because he, being its adherent, brings up the future generation in the same religion by his example, that is, parents involve their children into this religion, so they understand that paradise is not for them, 
there is no God for them there. And they will have to stay in hell anyway and be boiling in some kind of cauldron, right? So in order to be pulled out from there, from this cauldron into cold, cool water, it is necessary that someone pays for it. Because it's a paid service and thus children will pay for such moments of peace for them, let's put it so. Yes, moreover, what arguments they have. Today we raise the topic of those desires, and the adherents of this religion precisely say that it is in their religion where wishes get fulfilled much faster than in the others. Well, naturally, because their religion is sheer magic. Directly, yes. It is caring about the dead and formation out of the inevitably living, the inevitably dead, I mean, well, Well, yes, and the fact that the Holy Death itself has power over everyone in this world that no one has ever… Any body will die. There can be no immortal bodies. The whole universe is mortal. And the period of universe existence is an instant, if we consider it from the perspective of life. Yes. And what's also interesting is that all these religions, in one way or another, many religions, are future-oriented and focused on the promise to people that they will get something in the future. And when people do magic, they want to know precisely about the future. About the future. And why is that? Because a person who is again under the control of consciousness and is manipulated by it, always hears from consciousness one thing, you'll have a better life tomorrow, and a person always strives to create his best tomorrow. He does not live now, he lives in hope for tomorrow. And tomorrow is like a horizon. Will it ever happen? It will never happen. Because tomorrow you will be waiting for tomorrow. And it's endless until you become a subpersonality and realize that you had to live now. And what does freedom, spiritual freedom, precisely the true service to God, give a person? It gives now, today, here. Well, everything else gives hope for tomorrow. A demon can't grant life now. It just can't. It creates such a horizon. As soon as you reach the horizon, a beautiful future awaits you beyond it. You will be what you want and you will possess everything you want. Well, try to reach the horizon, my friends. To swim, to walk, to fly to it. It's unrealistic. It's true, people… It is also impossible to gain happiness from Satan. Indeed, people who live in the present and by this inner life have, say, this now and eternity, in here and now, they are unlikely to be interested in any future that the system tells them about. They don't need it. Yes. They don't need it, they need hope. And they live by hope. But instead of really becoming happy and living, people hope that someday they will have it, and they build, they form their desires and their happiness from the material, well, from some banal patterns that are imposed on everyone, let's say. Again, what do we come to? Tritely, to be someone, to have something, and not to be responsible for anything. This does not happen. And here is also Igor Mikhailovich. A lot of people would like to, they understand that there is something greater than a body, that there is… Some people believe that there is only the world of subtle energies and there is nothing beyond it. But in this aspiration… Well, wait. If there is a world of subtle energies, it means that there is something that forms it. Everything is simple. It's just that in this aspiration to come into contact with the spiritual world and with the spiritual source, to feel love, to get rid of some attachments in the outside world, they come to… Well, in particular, there are the rituals of ayahuasca, which are widespread in Latin America, in Peru. Even in some religions it becomes… In some countries, it is even a national asset. These are such hallucinogenic substances, hallucinogenic plants, and people go to the world's end, fly several thousand kilometers away to… To get this ritual, this experience, to break free from their problems, so as to get rid of what they have accumulated by their choice in the moment. And it takes a huge amount of time, money, and moving from one side of the earth to the other. 
To get another illusion. Yes, yes, to get… And what's going on? And what's attractive about it all? Again, it's a toxin that affects a neural group of the brain, I emphasize. And there's a partial disconnection, but it acts selectively. It turns out that there is not a complete disconnection, but a partial disconnection between personality and primary consciousness. And here, at the level of personality, he gets some freedom from secondary consciousness, from primary consciousness. And he also gets all this visually at the level of the primary consciousness. The world changes for him, and he gets an illusion of some kind of freedom, that the world is not as it is. Well, depending on the correctly chosen substances that they take, a person can even move to the fourth dimension and perceive it at the level of personality. And this happens, and through backward connection, this information can reach primary consciousness. And when he comes to a normal state, he remembers everything to the smallest detail. They consider this a very valuable experience of gaining life. It seems to them that they become spiritual, that they understand everything. All embracing vision, yes. That they know everything. Well, of course. Well, that's self-deception. You said that it's just the fourth dimension. It's just the fourth one, yes. Meaning, by getting used in such psychotropic substances, hallucinations… Not always they get there. Not always at all. Those are the ones who get lucky. And this all was selected and made right by someone with experience. In this case, a person almost becomes a slave of this trend. Why? Because what he has lived through and experienced is impossible to compare with anything that a person experiences in this three-dimensionality. But even if some mistake has happened, and it works merely as a hallucinogen, yes? However, having certain freedom plus hallucination, the person falls into shock as well, because his mentality is so free. Yes. He perceives the world so holistically. A human usually perceives the world from a viewing angle, meaning that is what we see. Next. If we hear something, we have switched off here, switch over there, meaning where we invest our attention, what our primary consciousness has given us, where we have invested our attention, is what we perceive, and we perceive the world, sort of, in bits and pieces. Well, here a person perceives it at 360 degrees, like a sphere, he senses it all, he… well, it's trite, well… He understands everything. Let's put it this way, a correctly performed meditation, meditation, I emphasize, is not a spiritual practice, it is a work of consciousness with consciousness, gives a much bigger effect. But you have to grow up to a meditative practice, you have to overcome a lot, have to spend your time while here you just eat or drink a tincture and hallucinations begin. Well, there's a small detail here too. When a person perceives three-dimensional images, it's a simple hallucination. The fourth dimension means these images change. And those who have experienced these practices understand what I'm talking about. This world is already altered and different, but it exists indeed. Well, but how? How it cannot be there? The world of energies, a kaleidoscope of colors. Sure, of course, the world of coarse matter is six dimensions. It's considered the coarse matter world, meaning it is where demons rule, where there is Satan's power. As it is said, everything that we see here in three-dimensionality originates in the sixth dimension, and it diminishes already in the second one. Well, it is actually very interesting, meaning it turns out that you mentioned that even getting into the fourth dimension is an extremely rare case. That is, it turns out that people gain all this experience. Of course, it's extremely rare, yes, but legends are built on such cases, for which they strive. Meaning, what people see is still the third dimension. Most of the time, yes. The overwhelming majority, I would say 99.9% of those who practice intake of these substances, let's put it mildly, most often have a banal hallucination. Well, it just, you know, such very… Well, it's an unusual experience. It's simply a swindle from the system, because… In the literal sense of the word… It doesn't matter whether you close your eyes or open your eyes, take a look at the surrounding world and pictures that… So, look, here you close your eyes and the world disappeared for you. But there, it doesn't matter whether you close or open your eyes, it won't work for you. No difference. Meaning… While the mechanism is very simple, there are simple techniques, but they are quite effective, they are considered restricted and secret for some reason. Precisely those very super-secret institutions which we have mentioned, which engage in research of magic, prepare so-called sleepers. I think many have heard of them. 
As a rule, they were used for military purposes and intelligence and so on. They have a simple technique which causes… Well, I'm going to tell you how it works. Irritation or excitation of neurons of the optic thalamus is caused. But without the supply of light, that is, a person's eyes are closed, he's in a dark room, not only he's in a dark room, but his eyes are also closed and all. However, over-irritation takes place. This over-irritation of the optic thalamus leads to the excitation of the so-called pineal gland. And that's where all these phenomena are hidden. Because a person, in order to maintain a connection between personality and primary consciousness and to shift it, for perception by primary consciousness, at least partially, because if primary consciousness is switching off, then a person who is unprepared, who hasn't developed himself and doesn't know that he is personality, he doesn't remember or see anything, he simply falls asleep, this connection is followed by sleep. For a person, this time simply vanishes. But when a person develops spiritually as personality, then a disconnection from this already gives him freedom from primary consciousness, not to mention secondary consciousness. But for this, one needs to overcome a lot, let's say, to work hard on oneself, indeed. And a simple practice, which is taught to sleepers, leads to overexcitation, and without losing connection with primary consciousness, a person partially jumps into the fourth and even to the fifth dimension sometimes. What does this result in? This results in the fact that space and time, as such, cease to work and a person, well, perceives easily if he knows how to control this process, then it is not difficult for him to visit any point and see what he wants to see, let's say. That is, the issue of precognition is solved quite simply here. And that's why they say that sleepers can see or find submarines, spaceships. Yes, of course, they can, there is nothing complicated about this. There is such a mechanism. The most interesting part is that if a sleeper uses this technique, and it is extremely simple, by the way, he can regulate and control this process, whereas if this mechanism is poorly controlled, then in this case everything happens spontaneously. A person closes his eyes and he has bright colors, it doesn't matter whether he opens or closes them, nothing changes. I mean, we have closed our eyes now, right? We can imagine the picture which we have seen, we opened our eyes and what do we see? We see again what we see, yes? That it has changed. Well, there, it is all different. Uncontrollable. Yes, it's not three-dimensional, but there is an understanding of it as of three-dimensionality as well. This is the paradox. This is when a person, for example, falls into the fourth dimension through the use of these substances, and the mechanism is exactly the same. Excitation of the optic thalamus. Neurons are overexcited, they excite the pineal gland, and the person enters a world where he has never been. But it's the earthly world, guys. After all, this is not God's world. And when they are, let's say, taken out of this state, the secondary consciousness gets immediately connected, while he preserved a memory of what he had seen. And so the person is in shock, and secondary consciousness begins to tell him, you have visited the world of God, wow, all this exists, that's it, now magic is the most essential for you. Well, well, he doesn't follow the spiritual path after all. And such people, all these experiments precisely lead them all towards a subpersonality. Well, a person naturally cannot come into contact with God. Due to these practices, of course not. Because many people think that they get relief from some consciousness. No, of course not. And they get to a new level, to a new dimension, yes. Igor Mikhailovich, you just said that sleepers used a certain practice too, and they achieved prescience, so to speak, a vision of the future. Can we give this practice to our viewers now? Well, it's really simple, there is nothing complicated in it. Well, we can give it. However, we have the experience, say, related to Dimak, yes? Yes. When we showed how to work with some points and that this practice, which we told our friends, is directed at, I repeat several times, guys, don't play with it. This practice is aimed only to ease one state in case of a panic attack. Well, it was so, wasn't it? Well, our friends started using this, and a lot of different information came from all sides and sometimes 
quite funny one, let's put it so. Well, many people started using it. Well, I'll give a simple example. Pardon me, friends, I'll digress a bit, but it's true. I use it, he says, every evening. It's so great, I don't want to sleep, I have energy. Guys, this practice, which we talked about, about Dimag, yes? It is aimed at helping in a critical situation. It cannot and should not be used when it is not necessary. Why? Because if people start abusing it, they just discharge the batteries, nothing appears out of nowhere. And the explosion of energy that occurs in a person, yes, it can help, can neutralize some toxins or something else, well, like a self-reanimation aid. But if a person abuses it, then first his body is exhausted, and subsequently self-compensation appears, and the body adapts, and these points do not work anymore. That's the way a human being is designed, and you should not play with this. And Dimag itself, well, many people say that it sort of, well, was transformed into something bad, that it's an art of killing. No. Everything that concerns self-defense or practical application, let's say, in order to defeat the enemy or the opponent, it isn't more than even 5% of what Dimag is now. Well, 95% is only good and useful regarding both health and well-being, well, and many other things. Of course, there is a lot of I could tell you. But guys, how can I tell you? Well, excuse me, well, because of these, and we have a lot of them, experimenters, there's no other way to call them. Well, it's just scary to tell you about something good and working. Well, it's true. Why? Because what is going to happen? Abuse, pointlessness, which can harm. For instance, you again say, about sleeper's practice. It is simple, and everyone can do it. But if we tell them about it, people can lose their eyesight, people can get heart attacks, strokes, and many other things. Why? It is about the dosage. And many people who have taken a great interest in this topic, or read at least about sleepers, how they work, they know how high their mortality rate is. Why? Because after crossing a certain threshold, well, people became subpersonalities. You can't return already that is, or they undermined their health by improper performance of the technique. I'll tell you a quite interesting, curious case, literally from life. After the release of the program, mm -hmm. where we talked about Dimak, it was released in the morning, and literally the next day, one of our fellows wrote us. So, I tell you in short, he wrote it all down, with details and the like, what was the essence? He watches our programs, like many of our friends. He even says that he began to read Alatra, he has read about 15 pages of it. Well, an almost convinced adherent of Alatra and all. He's heard, somewhere has got some information on how to perform spiritual practices, even how to perform the lotus flower meditation. He has realized that this practice has existed since ancient times and it's all good, this has to be done. But he had a toothache. He began to perform the lotus flower meditation. And direct love to the aching tooth. Doesn't it remind you of anything in today's conversation? However, this tooth didn't stop aching. He had to make an appointment with the doctor. Well, the doctor made an appointment at the afternoon time. Meanwhile, in the morning, our program was released. His tooth was aching. He had time. He didn't go to work anyway. So, as a faithful Alatra adherent, he decided to watch it. He turned on the program, started watching it, and saw everything I had told about Dim Mak. Usually, people need to watch at least a few times, somehow pay their attention, but in this case, the person turned out to be talented. He watched, remembered, and understood everything. He came to the dentist, the dentist examined him. In short, the tooth was in a big trouble. The doctor said, we will have to open it, remove the nerve, and clean it all up. He gave him an injection and said, Anesthesia will start working soon. I'll come to you shortly. Meanwhile, you take a seat. He advised it idle, if he just watched about Dimak, which Mikhailovich had told about, right? After all, it is interesting. A compelling logic has turned on. After all, it's… What is anesthetic? It is a toxin, which affects the nerve. So, if I do as Mikhailovich has said, then in theory it should 
sees its effect. Hence, Dimag works. And Mikhailovich did not lie, right? And if he doesn't cease, and anesthesia begins to work anyway, then something is wrong. He did this practice, then the doctor came up and said, How's your tooth? They examined it, and it was numb. Frustrated, he opened his mouth. This meant that everything was as it should be, and so the doctor began his work. This man told us that he was even slightly upset that the effect didn't take place. And at that moment, as it always happens, all of a sudden, there appears pain. Because there is a delay, there is chemistry, which works in the body, everything takes time. So he had a tooth opened, and the doctor was freely poking around his nerve. And here came a pain shock, as he wrote, I almost got a pain shock. The doctor, as he said, was also sweating, scared. Why did the pain return? He gave him additional, additional injections. Yet the pain, as he described, was getting even more acute. In short, both the doctor and the patient were in shock, as he told us. The doctor said, the tooth is open, everything is gouged out, we have to work on it, be with me, we have no other options. Otherwise, we will have to do general anesthesia. But he was afraid that Dimag did work. And general anesthesia would not help either, whereas he had already been injected with quite a lot of chemicals, which wasn't good for health either. Forgive me for laughing, I feel sorry for my colleague. I'm not laughing at the patient, I, I just imagine how the poor doctor makes the decision. And, and how he didn't know what to do with him. After all, the patient didn't tell him that he had been playing around. He simply let him guessing. And so he described as he was standing on the back of his head and heels, while the doctor quickly tormented him and the like. Then he sent him home and prescribed a painkiller. So he was writing an email to me already in the morning. He didn't sleep all night. He had severe pains because the painkiller didn't work. And so he told me everything he thought about me, about you too, and about the whole Alatra. And here I have a question. My friends, clearly, this case is funny, but it's a real one. Frankly speaking, it is the doctor who I am sorry for. As for the patient, I'm not sorry for the patient, stupidity has to be paid for. But I do feel sorry for the doctor, he was affected, though he wasn't guilty. But now, I have a simple question for many people, right? If you don't like us, you don't like me, you don't like the host, there are also invited people with whom we are often filmed. Well, if you can express your indignation towards us, but why us? Why blame the entire Alatra movement because of us, let's say? We are just the participants of the Alatra International Public Movement, just a small part of it. Well, in Alatra, there are a lot of people, and a lot of good, really beautiful, really positive deeds are being done. Well, mind you, people in their spare time do a lot of good for other people. After all, what does consciousness say? Well, consciousness says, you've got to do bad things to people, and people are able to spend time on doing something bad and wicked. But in order, to do good to people, one should step over a demon in the head. And it's hard. See, for those who scold us, it is actually simple. They have easily thrown mud at others, haven't they? Why? Because when finding himself in or running across such community, a person feels like a black crow among white swans, and this crow starts doing anything in order to sort of make them grayer somehow, in order not to stand out so much. But instead of becoming a swan himself, but this is difficult, it's simpler, like consciousness says, to smudge them. Guys, smudge me, smudge them, they will forgive you. But don't take the movement, there are really a lot of people who do a lot of good. Forgive me for such digression, but I've just thought of this. Dentist patient and unwittingly recalled what he wrote. Well, he mentioned not only me, but also the whole movement. But what does the movement have to do with it? Was it anyone else who told him about it? Well, I, pardon me, in an impulse of altruism, shared with people. And I could share other things as well, but now you understand why sometimes it's better to keep silent. Because demons in the head begin to mix everything up. 
and force people to use a good thing, not where it's needed, and get a negative effect. And afterwards they immediately start to accuse, it was they who instigated you to do a stupid thing. You did this stupid thing, financed it with your attention and your actions. And later it is they who accuse the third, let's say, parties that have nothing to do with this at all, in this case. Yes. Well, such a curious thing happened. So pardon me, friends, but get the information of that very sleeper and how it works, somewhere from other sources. Yes, even those who stand up for the Alatra movement, they too… They get it hot too, yes, of course. It turns out they get it hot too. Those who aren't even the participants just see the genuine strive of people, feel it. Good people, there are good people everywhere, and there are a lot of them, indeed. If a person is with an open soul, he looks at and perceives the whole world the way it is, without twisting and dictation of demons in his head, surely he sees how beautiful Alatra is and how much good is being done. Of course, they perceive it, but those who are ruled by little imps, for them Alatra, well, it's like a candle burning in one's eye. That's why they try to blow it out or spit at it so that it goes out. Yes. Yes, there is also a question that is asked precisely by those who are against Alatra. What does this give you? What did you get there? Oh yes, right, yes, that is also a good question, right. They say, so you are in Alatra, what did you get? What did this give you? Again, the material and the profit. This is exactly the answer to why people go and strive for magic. And why, while going into religion, they want to get something. And why? Such a synthesis of religion with magic occurred. On the one hand, they are telling the truth, one mustn't do magic. And on the other hand, they immediately justify it in every possible way, that it is in accordance with the will of God, from God. This is holy, this is not magic, this is the blessing of God. And they immediately push and impose that very magic, well… That's the answer. Yes. Consciousness will hardly like a perspective that you won't be given anything there, that you will only be helping people from your sincere impulse, meaning the awareness of this, yes. And feel great happiness from this. Well, yes. Yes, right. If looking from the perspective of, let's say, a person who lives under the dictatorship of the beast in his head, right, that means you go to an organization where in your spare time you have to do a lot of good, spend your funds and time in order to explain something to someone, to tell them and raise urgent issues, and nobody pays you anything for this. Moreover, it is you who spends, right? Well, what kind of organization is that? It turns out to be a wrong organization from Satan's perspective. Well, thank God there are those who understand this. Thank God. And thank you, friends, that there are many of you of those who really understand, feel and live by God's love. Exactly for this Alatra is needed. The entire movement is needed, so that the number of us, of free people, grows. That's the meaning of humanity, and that's the mission of a human being. Everyone says, a human has come to this world, he has some task, some… he has to do something, a mission. The mission of all of us is to become alive. However, to become a subpersonality to become dead cannot be a human's mission. Well, can this be right? So the task of those very people who have gained at least a little understanding, who at least started to feel something, is precisely to share this with others, so that it becomes bigger, so that this world changes, so as to return Eden here. After all, it is all in our hands, my friends. We can do everything if we want to. Also, Igor Mihailovich, we have another topic. It is the topic of Latin America, that on their territory, in particular in Peru, Colombia and Mexico, there are so many rituals of, so to say, bloodthirsty rituals, in which, basically, initiations of mages occur with the involvement of subpersonalities. Well, if we take Latin America, Spain and Mexico, as of today, there are more than 2,000 of real mages in this territory, the real ones of those who have power. It's a Serious. huge number, yes, huge. yes, and today they are the favorites. Mm -hmm. And by the way, as it is stated by those favorites themselves, Satan controls people's consciousness, mm -hmm. while mages control their tongues. And we know yes, that this is obvious. today among them there are also some who have a grudge against Alatra. Mm -hmm. 
a serious one. It turns out that mages do not watch the evil tongues or contribute to this. Well, taking into account that November begins and December is ahead, and for those who know, well, for those who do not know, I'll tell you what it has to do with November and December. November and December for mages, well, sorcerers, I mean all of them, this entire gang, for them it's a very important time. At this time, they accumulate power, that is, they receive this power for their demons, so that they become stronger. Then, during the year, they use this power in their work. Then it is pulled back, and these days are just as important for them. Well, let's put it this way, the end of October through Christmas is a very important time for accumulating power for them. Well, power is power. And the most interesting thing is that even those very demons and that very Satan use the power that is given for life. Magic cannot be forbidden all over the world, because it happens at people's choice. Satan cannot be forbidden, because this material world is his world, and he's the architect of this world. But it is possible to deprive of power those very sorcerers, mages, simply by taking it from their demons let's say, for the period of its accumulation in a particular region, well, for everyone's edification, let's say, those who are engaged in magic, and I'll remind you, there are more than 2,000 of them in Spain, Mexico, Latin America, will be left without replenishment during this season, in order that they watch the tongues that they control. Well, after all, it's them who said that. And now, guys, a small point. You can take this as a joke, but for those who can think, I'll mention it. Those who are really engaged in magic will be forced to leave this territory in order to replenish their power. This does not affect charlatans, but it's no use to come to mages till Christmas. No need to waste money. They won't be able to even move a feather from the needle, let alone to do something. And this, once again, shows that one needs to love God, but not to deny God's love, and all the more not to blaspheme it. For their edification, if they fail to understand, they will lose power during these days, forever, and then they will have to leave those territories. Well, even next year, in 2020, they will turn from favorites into outsiders, though, as of today, their magic has been leading the world. Next year, it won't. It's interesting. Watch those who are subordinate to you. Also, Igor Mikhailovich, you mentioned the seasonality of magic, and now there is an understanding that most people feel the autumn blues precisely in autumn. A period of exacerbation of various psychiatric diseases comes precisely in autumn, that is… And many events begin at this time, which decide people's destinies. So now it's clear that this is not just a lack of sunshine or good weather. It's a season. No, it's a season, a season of accumulation. And many who are in the web, of course, they experience an enormous exhaustion. Why? Well, I've already answered. Demons accumulate power for the season. It's like a crop. They've harvested the crop, and they use it all year, until there is a new one. This does not mean that powers don't come. They do come, though mages cannot use them. So they use what they have. Therefore, just like that, fellow said that he used to spend 24 hours on serving Satan. It's an enormous labor. If people invested as much into building life as they invest into building death, all would be saints. Igor Mikhailovich, also touching upon the topic, we've just touched upon this very region, and it is sort of a leader in various attributes, various amulets, rituals, so people ask the following question, do various attributes, a person's affiliation to a certain order 
or to various trends, movements, religious denominations with usage of signs and symbols give any kind of power to people or not? Meaning what they wear as insignia, right? Yes. Does it have any kind of power? Guys, this doesn't have any power. Plainly. The power of the human, the real power of the human, lies in his attention. And for instance, can the spiritual oppose the dead? It can, easily. If a person is alive, if he's with the spiritual world, well, let's say, at least near, his spiritual power increases, it's like a flame, which can… Well, the simplest example for understanding, we take one candle, we have talked about it, enter a room and it's getting brighter. Now imagine a thousand candles, and we enter this room, it will definitely be brighter. Or a person lit up a candle in the field, it's seen from afar, and he is seen from afar. While little is lit up around him, however, what if there is a thousand of candles? He will be seen even from a longer distance. A thousand candles lit up in the field at night will be seen even from outer space. What does it indicate? That power which he gains, right? Because besides him there are an infinite number of angels with whom he maintains contact. Can some pitiful nothing oppose everything? No, of course. It cannot. But the same goes with demons. If, say, a person is under Satan's power and, well, it's a figure of speech, let's say, under the dictatorship of that very system or demons, and these demons manipulate through him, they can have power over an unprotected person, because all their community is on their side, just like a whole legion, right? But it's still very limited. And the stronger the mage is, the stronger his demon is, the more power it takes from people, the higher he is in his hierarchy. And the higher he is in his demonic hierarchy, the bigger his power reserve is, the harder it is for an ordinary person to oppose him. Well, you see, everything is simple. The attributes don't play any part. Attributes just indicate affiliation to somewhere and to someone. But if a person let's say so, doesn't know what your sign is and what it is for, then it might be merely as some jewelry or something else. You see, it's nothing for him. So, but on the other hand, if they wear various skulls and something specific like this, well, of course, this attracts attention, this makes one open up in some way. Well provoke fear. And what is the main thing here? An emotion. And the following resonance. And an emotion can be provoked by hanging these skulls, feathers, well, something else, all over yourself, just like they often use it in magic, right? It doesn't have to be some intensive ritual. If his appearance makes him scary to look at, a person gets scared, and if he does, there is already an investment of attention. Emotion. And of course, now he opens up before him, and it's simpler for that one to resonate with him in order for demons to enter. And then he becomes a part of his food, meaning, in this case, a mage is a conductor between the demonic world and this. Well, in this case, it's already a hamburger or a goat, let's put it so, that is being used. In fact, everything is simple, so attributes are merely attributes. However, there are also working signs, we've talked about them already. Mm -hmm. Those ones, yes, those ones possess certain powers. Igor Mihailovich, you've also mentioned that the system's influence is precisely six dimensions, and that there are those who work in the sixth dimension, like black mages. Mages, of course there are. But are there also… They contribute to exactly changing of events at the level where they these events originate. Well, this is… And is there anyone at that level who opposes them in causing these events and counteracts them? You mean among people? Well, there are, of course. But it would be desirable if there were more of them. There are few of them in comparison. With that legion, one would say it's nothing. And such question was also asked regarding whether signs have a sound. 
meaning there are working signs. Do they have sounding? Everything that falls into a resonance has a sound, meaning any resonance is an audible or inaudible sound of some sort. And that's why surely there is sounding. Well, let's recall those very chladni figures, right? Well, those that are formed by sound, well, these are all the same effects. That's why any sign naturally has a sound. In general, let's say, any interaction is certain vibrations of some kind. Vibrations are sound. Well, it can be put this way too. It's just that there is a sound which we aren't able to perceive or hear. However, the whole universe is nothing else but a sound. And there is the sound which has created matter and can control it if we consider this from the highest possible perspective. Yes, besides various religions which are spreading now at lightning speed, such as Santa Muerte, there is also a religion of Buddhism, which is getting popularity now too. And at this moment its adherents are estimated to be 50 million people around the world. These are adherents, but once Voodooism as magic, they used to be the leaders. Well, now, there are a lot of adherents, but they have much fewer mages comparing to, let's suppose, that very Latin American group. By the way, it is they who can become the leaders in the year of 2020. Yes, so they also considered power that, well, their main deity is Ouroboros, it is kind of regarded as both good and bad, meaning it is simply a force which merely… And the force is a force. An active one, yes. But in this case, they look at that force which creates this world, which gives life, while this source that emerges and creates everything goes exactly out of the spiritual world. Do you remember, we were talking about a chamomile, we offered our friends to imagine a chamomile. Who created this chamomile? Again, each of you did, who actually imagined it, meaning you occurred to be the source of creation of a whole world, a whole life. Why? Since there is a chamomile, it means that there is a little bug on it. And since there is a bug, it means it's not the only one. And so forth and so on. And if to imagine all this, one can imagine a whole town. And a whole town will exist, but it will be limited only by the power of investment of your attention in that picture which you imagined at that time, which you allocated to it. Because once you get distracted and you forget about the chamomile and the bug and all the rest, and so are they. On the one hand, they are right about the force which is coming, that is the force which gives life. That is why demons chase after this power, power of life, which people waste, give away without thinking, that power which is given them here, so that they gain eternal life, that power, the power of attention, they give it for everything empty, they invest in some envy, in some, well, in any mortal thing, in aggression, in dreams. Well, what dreams can be there? Get up and do. If you want something, make it, do it. If you don't know how, learn it. And you'll have everything, everything will work out. Make demons serve, they will do it. But again, what do people want? For it to happen by a wave of a magic wand. Well, so it happens, and this is how religions appear. In this case, they are religions of sorcery. Yes. And their dark side became notorious, owing to the fact that they used to have a potion like ayahuasca that put a human in the state of death for some short period of time, after which the human returned to life with kind of zombie effects at that… He lived through the experience of this death. Yes, he experienced… well, he just… all the vital mechanisms were turned off and… Yes, a person loses his memory. Loses his memory. He doesn't know who he is. Yes, yes, after… And the like. But he still had primary consciousness. And such person was used right. later as a slave. Do you remember, we once talked about hypnosis, and that personality doesn't have a criticality of perception. Yes. yes. And if primary consciousness is partially suppressed, then secondary consciousness basically cannot enter. And here, the operator acts as a third force who puts a person into hypnosis and can instill into him that he's a famous singer and a person behaves absolutely like that singer. A personality doesn't care, because this concerns three-dimensionality and this doesn't bother it much. And primary consciousness already supplies information. 
That which it supplies, and personality uncritically invests attention in what is necessary. That is, the same effect as putting a person into the state of hypnosis works upon the intake of toxins, or rather, upon applying toxins on a person who consumed them in one way or another. It doesn't matter how it was injected in the form of a powder, liquid, or various substances were mixed into food, but a person by taking it has a problem with neurons, meaning certain connections get destroyed. And they are destroyed to such an extent that even the self-identification of primary consciousness does not work anymore. Naturally, connections with the bag essence are lost, meaning his memory is absolutely disconnected. The memory is… The memory is divided into several components. There is a basic memory, so let's not go into… Let's just say that all the past disappears, because it detached, let's say, the bag essence, the place where it is really stored, and what we call memory, because they… This memory comes through a certain group of neurons to primary consciousness. Well, such a mechanism. I do not want to go into it too much. We once talked about, described this already. Whoever wants to will find this and will read this. So, both that mechanism and this one leads to, well, if hypnosis is a brief effect, then here it's almost forever and only a few of those who have been put into a state of a zombie can return to a normal life to awake or to activate those neurons that have been disabled is extremely problematic. And a person becomes like a child, he doesn't remember, doesn't know, but he can work physically, he can do some work. He doesn't have such a critical approach to himself. Well, it's a machine, a machine that serves itself and can do something. Well, that's not the worst thing about their religion. What is much scarier in the Voodoo religion is that they practice remote influence. It is oriented more at harm, at a distance, to health, to death. They have developed it very well. If we compare it with, say, Latin American region, where they have rather a consumer attitude to get something for themselves, here it is punishing someone. To do harm. That prevails. Yes, and it's also interesting, by the way, that when we study this issue, they say that there is a certain similarity between science and magic, and the fact that there is a certain cause and effect relationship, that if you did A, you received B, if you did one thing, you received another thing, and at the same time, the issue was raised of this non-contact influence or influence at a distance through the objects that a person held in his hands or touched. Of course. But all this leads to… A simple example, I'll digress, a person touch something. Mm -hmm. After all, he leaves his energy signature. Mm -hmm. Just like a dog, when a man walked by, the dog is put on the sand and it follows the smell. The same is here. If this object still retains the activity of this person, the mage can influence through it. But it can work only when a person, excuse me, is under the control of demons. If the demons that control this person are weaker than the demon that attacks, then everything will be as this mage wants, if his demon is stronger than those demons. Well, it's a simple mechanism. Well, if a person, excuse me, is with Alatra inside, he loves God, he's filled with this, this mage will simply not see him. Invisible to the system. Even if he sees that person, he won't be able to reach him. The darkness does not approach the light. Now it's clear why in ancient times, when many people said about the warrior host, they wanted to be invisible to the enemy, this understanding that the majority… But again, it was a different warrior host, and they said about something different. Precisely those galliars were mentioned, who actually stand as the light to guard people against the darkness, who stand to ensure that there is less influence on people who protect. Just like you asked, are there those who… Yes, there are, but they are very few. But they exist. Well, before, there were more of them, and there was less darkness. That's the point. However, consciousness again took this information, twisted it like it is a legend, and turned to what? To our usual, everyday, banal, three-dimensionality. And here a person wants to become invisible for his three-dimensional enemy. Well, and everything is being done for this. Yes. And again, he turns to magic. However, does this happen? It does. In the previous program we mentioned 
that very Chikatilo when, excuse me, he killed a person, people passed by and didn't actually see him. This is that power, that demon, which attacked this very Chikatilo and committed this crime. With his hands, he possesses a huge power. And such things happen. So, we precisely touched upon this influence, so to speak, at a distance. And, interestingly, even scientists themselves, and that very mages note that there is probably some space in which this information is transferred very quickly from one object to another, and they speak about the existence of something similar to the ether, as it is called in science, that through this there happens. Well, there is no ether, as modern physics asserts, so… well, but something similar probably exists. Well, I see. I don't want to go into physics, forgive me, friends, but we can talk about it for another three hours. Yes. There is also a question, well, such a question, about burial of shamans, that if there was a sorcerer or shaman who possessed real power, then after a certain time, people living in the territory under his control should perform certain rituals to live in peace, in other words, sort of under his protection, so that he wouldn't prevent them from living. Wait, is it in peace under his protection or against his influence? They want him not to do bad things to them, but to do good things to them, so they will have to… Yes, to bury him or to implement some other… They must remember his image and his name. Yes. First of all, and to think of him at least on some holidays, to comfort him somehow. Yes, as a subpersonality, he won't be able any longer to do anything, but the demon who ruled him remains connected to subpersonality, and yet he will still receive the payment that people give him, meaning the demon will benefit anyway. They also touched upon the topic of subpersonality. In particular, there is a ritual of Santeria in Latin countries where, when initiating, say, a new young mage, they resort to such actions when they come to the cemetery, choose a certain dead man, and he should be the most vicious rapist, the most vicious criminal, violator and criminal, yes. They bury close there. It turns out that people want to pull the chestnuts out of the fire, so to speak, yes, that is… With the hands of a dead man. With the hands of a dead man, yes, so that he performs. Well, here, they are using cunning already. Well, in fact, these are empty rituals that really say, can they shock a person? They can. And they do shock. They impress. Well, just imagine, first this dead man must be dug up, secondly he… there is a decomposing body next to you, you enter this magic and you realize it's death, and there's a dead body next to you, well… understanding of this death is inevitable, and there are also spells plus the ritual itself. Making a potion, well… You left it unsaid, but in general they used and keep using juices that are secreted from the body. Well, in general, this rotting body, these toxins, everything, it all mixes up, well, to be honest, it's proportion, and they immediately use other substances, plants and the like, which disinfect, let's put it so. It's good that they do at least this. Still, a person should consume it, well, of course, it will be harmless, because other substances neutralize poisons that are secreted from the dead body, but nevertheless, however disgusting it all is, but a person goes for it. Stepping over everything, seeing death and understanding who he will be to gain this power, this is one of the tests they have. Well, it's just one of the tests. Well, there are actually a lot of them. There's plunge into magic and these rituals, they are each one funnier than the last. Well, imagine how much one has to thirst for this secret power to go through all this. It's all empty. Well, a human has played with it for 20, 30, 50 years, but he will still be a subpersonality. It is empty anyway, after all, you won't take anything with you. Yes. What is the point? Oh, Igor Mikhailovich, the topic we have today was, let's say, a little bit viscous and difficult. And I just want to say thank you very much. Well, magic is always magic. That, despite the fact that the topic is like this, you still brought so much understanding, so much depth, sincerity. Well, God willing, for people's benefit. So, my friends, 
Excuse us, but we would like to finish with this magic, this devilry. We had a program about the Ninth Circle, now the program about magic. Well, my heart is sort of not in these topics, as people say. Let it be questions about something spiritual, something beautiful. Well, something we want to talk about, something that makes us want to live. Well, this is all empty, this is all material. Anyway, any power, any magic, all this is the games of consciousness, it's all an illusion. Everything passes, and this will pass, and all the more. Friends, let's live in love with each other, so that it never goes away. Let's live in friendship and love. Thank you for being with us and bearing with us. Till the end of the program. Thank you, Igor Mikhailovich. There was such an enormous depth today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, my friends, for being with us.